is just a huge, huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Jessica Ann Rickert, DDS, who is the first female American Indian dentist in the world. She attended the University of Michigan from 68 to 75. In 75, she established a private dental practice. From 75 to 82, she was the director of the dental clinic at the Children's Aid Society, a private agency for foster care children in Detroit. There, she initiated programs in preventative dentistry and orthodontia, as well as providing general dental services. From 07 to 10, she was provided uh, general dental services for the Department of Corrections of the state of Michigan. In 2011, she provided dentistry in the Michigan Community Dental Clinics on a full-time basis. Currently, she is a clinical dentist at the Family Healthcare Organization of Michigan. She treats each patient with compassion, confidence, competence, and kindness. She served on the Michigan Urban Indian Health Council Board of Directors and established a dental clinic at the Detroit Urban Indian Health Clinic in 79. Most recently, she she also served on the task force to establish a dental clinic on the reservation of the Grand Traverse Band at Chippewa Ottawa Indians. And she has served on the board of directors of the Society of American Indian Dentists. She's an active member of the American Dental Association, having chaired the Oakland County Dental Society's Speakers Bureau. She served on the Michigan Dental Association's Public Relations Committee, a past president of the Resort District Dental Society. She remains active in presenting dental education programs in area schools and volunteers volunteers with a Give Kids a Smile program. She attended University of Michigan. Um, um, so, I mean, your, your, your uh, bio goes on forever and ever and arrow. Congratulations on being, I mean, everybody remembers the, the first man who stood on the moon. How, tell us about your journey. How did you become the first woman American Indian dentist? Well, when uh, I was young, I'm the oldest of seven children. And I was raised in Wyoming, Michigan, which is near the Grand River in Michigan. And as a matter of fact, that's where the Potawatomi lived 10,000 years ago. They lived on the Grand River and the Kalamazoo Rivers in western Michigan. And so that, that is where my family is still. And when I was young, our family doctor took an interest in me. And he suggested that I consider nursing. So he invited me into his office, a private pediatrician's office, and I visited him, and while he was taking care of his patients, I was looking over his anatomy and physiology books, and he was talking to me, and he said, uh, Jess, uh, Jessica, I, I think actually you could possibly be a doctor. And so once he said that to me, I thought, well, why not? So I took the advanced classes in a small Class B school district, Wyoming Public Schools, I took the advanced math, advanced science, and I really enjoyed it. And I talked to my high school counselor and I said, I want to be a doctor. And he was pretty surprised. He was pretty shocked. And he said, well, um, well, uh, the University of Michigan has a medical school. You could apply there and, and good luck to you. So then I took the college boards exam and I applied to the University of Michigan and I was the only student from Wyoming Public Schools to be accepted at the University of Michigan that year. So then I went to the University of Michigan and I thought I would be a chemistry major, which I really enjoyed. And at the University of Michigan, they have the School of Medicine, School of Dentistry, School of Pharmacy, nursing school. So I visited those schools and I became most interested in dentistry and medicine. And one day when I was at the dental school, there was a dental student casting a gold crown and it just totally intrigued me that this beautiful metal, this precious metal could be used to restore a patient to form and function for years and years and years and years. And so in the end, I decided dentistry would be a career that I would really enjoy. And I entered a brand new dental school building at the University of Michigan. In, in the fall of 1971. So where, where, what city did you say you were born in? I actually was born in Denver, Colorado, but my family moved back to Wy uh, Wyoming, Michigan, which is just oh, south. Okay. It's just south of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Okay, that's where my brain was messed up because every time you said Wyoming, I thought, did she just say she was from, Wy I thought she was from Michigan. So there's actually a Wyoming, Michigan. Yes, it's just, it's a small suburb south of Grand Rapids, yes. 
Oh, and, name- and Grand Rapids was the first city in the world to adjust the fluoride level. January 21, 1940. Yeah, 1947? 1947, I think 45. Um, um, let, let's uh, find out. Uh, when did uh, uh, Grand... When did Grand Rapids uh, add fluoride? Um, and and they have a monument, a museum. It was um, yeah. Let's see how close we were. Um, oh, January twenty fifth, nineteen forty five. Uh, Grand Rapids, which was that, and you. So, how far away were you from uh, Grand Rapids? Well, when I was growing up, Wyoming actually was farm country, so we had our own well which did not have fluoride in it. But when we would go to Grand Rapids for functions and things, that water had fluoride in it. And the caries rate in Grand Rapids general population fell dramatically year by year by year until, as you know, the other communities in the country decided that it would be wise to add fluoride to their water. So, uh, uh, I, yeah, they had- Go ahead. They have a monument down right by the Grand River. Yeah. The Grand River runs through the uh, main heart of Grand Rapids, and they made a monument, and they have um, a sculpture. It almost looks like flowing water in the sculpture, and they talk about that was a public health success story in Michigan. I, I wish it was a movie because I think what the public health dentist, you know, there's 10 specialties recognized by dentistry and, and the orthodontist and endodontist and periodontist, they, they get all the attention, but the public health, my gosh, yeah. especially you, you're a baby of seven kids. I was uh, the third child of seven kids where, um, you know, and I, I think the public health dentists are amazing, but when they did this Grand Rapids, that public health dentist was so genius. He knew the nature of humans and humans are a very complicated creature. And so what he did is when he, um, he announced he's going to turn on Monday morning at eight o'clock. And, um, and then of course all the crazies came out and they were allergic reactions and emergency rooms. And it was just drama central. And the, the mayor kept wanting this dentist to answer, go public or hold a news con, And he just disappeared. And finally, uh-huh. after a day or two, they said, you got to go public. So he went public and they start telling him all this stuff. And he goes, exactly. I haven't turned it on yet. I knew this would happen. So everybody that ran to the emergency room is crazy. And I'm going to go ahead and start it tomorrow. I mean, just, I mean, how, how genius was that to understand was- the nature of human beings that, that alone. Um, but you know what? I am, um, we, we have deep roots. Um, I live in Phoenix, Arizona. I was born and raised in Kansas for then when I graduated from dental school in Kansas City. I moved out here to Arizona in 87. And the legendary dentist out here is George Blue Spruce, who was actually the first American uh, Indian dentist male. And I am, uh, I just drove up and had dinner um, um, with Jack Dillenberg, the retired dean of the dental school. But that was Jack. And George's dream was to get more Native American Indians. I mean, Jack, I remember Jack telling me this 20 years ago. He goes, he goes, um, why don't the Navajos go to dental school and work on the Navajos? Why, why are we sending up public health people to do this? I want, you know, I want all, there's uh, something like 19 tribes in Arizona. He says, I, I want their people to become. So how was that, prog- how was uh, your dream, Jack Dillenberg's dream, George Blue Spruce's dream, how, how was that moving along? Uh, well, we do have several programs going on. The Society of American Indian Dentists has been outreaching to um, college students and dental students, trying to encourage them. And... It is really difficult because it's over the whole nation, including Alaska. So that's a huge geographic area, and the number of American Indian dentists is very small. Right now, we believe there's 175. And in order for there to be parity with the American population, there should be 3,000 American Indian dentists. And we believe there are 175. So if you have 175 dentists who are trying to outreach to the uh, American Indian youth, it's just a huge job. We do outreach to them, but it's a very um, hard job. 
I believe the only two retired American Indian dentists are Dr. George Blue Spruce and myself. I believe that's true. I, I could be wrong about that, but most of them are quite a bit younger than we are. Um, so we don't have a legacy yet in the Society of American Indian Dentists. And that's another thing that makes it kind of hard. So we are still outreaching and we have lots of help. The Henry Shine, uh, I better not start naming our supporters because I don't want to forget one and I don't have my book with me right here. But we do have a lots of supporters from the dental community, including the American Dental Association. I, I want to ask you, you, you specifically when we were talking about this, you, you said, you know, it's a big country, including Alaska. And Alaska seems to be significant because even in the name, the Society of American Indian Dentists, um, S-A-I-D, uh, or um, A-I-N, A-I-A-N, it stands for uh, American Indian Alaskan Natives. Why Why is it just not American Indians? Why Why is there, um, why is Alaskan Natives um, to differentiate? Or is that special, different? What, what's, what's the thinking behind that? When we uh, started the Society of American Indian Dentists, I believe it was in 1983, there were no Alaskan in, uh, Native dentists. So we just, uh, Dr. George Blue, Blue Spruce and us talked about it, and we decided to use American Indian dentists because it was just the lower uh, states that were involved. Well, then we now have Alaskan Native dentists, and they ask us to um, use that term so we do. We didn't put it in our society because that was already chartered. But the Alaska Natives prefer to be called Alaska Natives. So we... Um, and do American Indians, uh, Native American Indians, do they, pref do they, is, is, they like the term American Indian? They have accepted it. Um, most of the treaties use the term American Indian. And most of the outreaches through the BIA, Bureau of American Indians, and so on, they use the term American Indian, American Indian, so we dentists have accepted it because it gets tricky otherwise. But if you ask individuals like myself, what I prefer, I prefer to be called an, Anish an Anishinaabe. Anishinaabe in the Algonquin language means original people. And that's what we called ourselves, the people that lived around the Great Lakes. We called ourselves the Anishinaabe. So we would pre be prefer to be called that, but it just gets so confusing for everybody that we've accepted American Indian. Huh, that, so Ishnadi means original people. Um, so, um, so is the, um, so how is uh, the Society of American Indian Dentists uh, working to attract more uh, American Indian Alaska natives uh, to dentistry? Um, right now, I'm working with the Seneca Nation and the Univers University of Buffalo School of Dental Medicine. They have what's called a gateway program. The gateway program accepts college students on their campus for a week in the summer, and they actually go to the dental school, and they um, do things on type of dots. They take impressions on type of dots. They actually sit in a dentist chair um, and do things simulating what it might be like to be a dentist. And in the gateway program, they talk about how to prepare for the dental aptitude tests. When I was going to college, probably Dr. George Booth Booth as well, nobody really told us to prepare for the college boards. Nobody told us to prepare for the dental aptitude tests. They just told us it was a requirement. And we just went and took it. So we try to tell them how to prepare for the dental aptitude test, look over what they're studying as undergraduates and say, hey, no, you really need to take the math courses up to the 300 level or just give them advice. So that's one way. Again, that has been difficult because we have people that want to come, let's say from Alaska, and there's no charge at all for the program and the housing and the food and things, but we so far we're not able to cover travel, so that prohibits, seems to prohibit some students who want to come from being able to come. And now we also, through Delta Dental in Michigan, we are doing an outreach to the 12 Michigan tribes to high school students. 
So we're trying to form uh, pre-dental clubs, uh, not officially structured, but just trying to get them interested in dentistry. And then in the sixth grade, we're working on the STEM programs to include dentistry in their STEM offerings. And the University of Nebraska, they developed a poster series called The Power of Role Models. And this is geared towards American Indian Alaska Native students. And it's not just dentistry, it's all the professions such as an astronaut, um, an ichthyologist, medical doctors, pharmacy, social workers, veterinarians, uh, lawyers, any American Indian like myself who was able to be successful, they made a, uh, individual posters. And this is actually free. Anybody can download it. You can download it. Uh, any, it it's not just for American Indians, but anybody can download it for free. So, What website to download it for free? Uh, I will have to look that one up. It's through the University of Nebraska. Okay. I will. I, um, could, can I possibly email that to you later? Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, I can email you those links. And so, and then we're trying to have a reading readiness program through Delta Dental. And this reading re readiness is going to try to link excellent dental health for four and five year olds so that they will be able to concentrate on reading, speaking, enunciation, pronunciation, and things like that. Because as you know, speech depends a great deal on healthy teeth. And so we're trying to have a reading readiness program for first graders. This is all in the preliminary stages and I have been helping them with this. The other thing that we're going to try to do is make the patient education brochures, which Delta Dental puts out, we're trying to write them in the Anishinaabe language. We're trying to write them in the Algonquin language. We'll use the same graphics they have. They have a coloring book about healthy teeth and a good diet, things like that, visiting the dentist. We're going to take that same coloring book and we're going to translate it into the Anishinaabe language. I personally am not an expert in the Anishinaabe language, so I will be working with the um, Michigan tribes, probably the Saginaw Chippewa tribe, to um, make that translation. And when we get that translation done, we'll make it available to all the Great Lakes. I mean, it would be available to the entire nation, but um, the tribes which spoke the Algonquin language are around the Great Lakes. So we are making efforts, but to reiterate, I'm only one person, and Dr. Blue Spruce is only one person. It is really hard for us to reach out like we should be doing. And the reason I know it's really hard is, sadly, in the whole United States, currently there are 14 American Indian Alaska Native dental students, mostly in the dental schools out west. 14. That's very dismal. And what do you what, what do you attribute that? Um, the uh, undergraduates <clears throat> who probably do decide maybe I'll go to dental school, they're not ready. Sometimes they're not ready. They haven't had um, true mentorship to get them ready. I mean, as you know, you can't go a week before the college board and say, ooh, what should I study so I can get a good grade on the college board. You have to start in the sixth grade. Right. To do it. So that's, they're not, they're not ready. That's uh, probably the main issue. They have the brain power and they have the desire, but they just haven't had the um, honor classes, the advanced classes, um, workshops, things like that. that. We're trying to help with the gateway program, but it's just a start. Huh. That is, uh, that is interesting. Um, so how is the, um, are you, are you noticing kids, uh, taking to this, uh, this program? Uh, yes, we, the gateway program that, uh, Dr. Solomon and I did in New York, 
We have asked those attendees to tell their brothers and sisters, tell their cousins, go back to their families and tribal headquarters and let everybody know there that dentistry is welcoming them and they're able to do it and to come out to this gateway program and at least to see what it's all about. So the, we're spreading the word that way. And um, I'm going to be going to talk to the Michigan Oral Health Coalition on this Friday. And I'm going to talk to them about that. So we're trying to publicize it, yes. That's uh, amazing. But you know, it's uh, so much of success. A lot of it's um, luck, being in the right place at the right time, uh, all these different things. But uh, yeah, mentors is so uh -huh. huge. And the first thing that you mentioned was your childhood physician. And uh, the first thing that happened to me was when I, you know, I was shy, but I asked my next door neighbor if I could go to work with him. He's a dentist, Kenny Anderson. Oh, okay. In fact, he's still practicing. And I knew he'd say no. And I was shocked when he said, well, of course, when, when do you want to go? And uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, so so just mentoring a young kid. And and, and I cringe sometimes when you're at your friend's house and the adults are all sitting around talking. You see this little two or three or four year old kid starving to join the conversation. And when I was little, the adults would always say, you know, children should be seen, not heard. Right. And nowadays you see adults realizing that, hey, you and me talking about whatever we're talking about isn't nearly as important as this starving three-year-old. Let's let's entertain what 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 is little granddaughter thinking. So uh, that, that that is so neat. Um, so what is um so you've seen um, big changes in your life uh, in the uh, um, realities of Native American Indians, American Indians, Alaskan Indians. Um, how how is that journey going? Is is it progressing? Um, fast as you'd like, slower, you know, what, what, what are your challenges today? Would you say? Well, it is progressing slower, but at the last, uh, society of American Indian dentist meeting, which was in Oklahoma, I was able to have my photo taken with the youngest American Indian de dentist who is Dr. Susan Sergi. She's an Alaska native. And they actually put that picture in the American dental association news because I'm the oldest and she's the youngest. So ah. <laughs> and women, women never like to tell their age. So how, how, how were you uh, giving away your age? <laughs> I'm 29 plus. You're 20. <laughs> I'm 69. I don't mind if people know how old I am. I have three adult children and they're fabulous. And I have wonderful in-law children, 11 grandkids. I mean, I have to be pretty old. So if they know I'm 69, I, that's fine. Yeah. And how, how do you like uh, uh, being um, at this time of our life as opposed to when we were in college? Are you, are you enjoying these years or do you, do you I, would you wish I, they invented anti-aging and you could go back to 21? <laughs> um, I'll tell you, dentistry has been extremely good to me. I enjoyed college. That was just fascinating. And I have many friends that I made in college and I did enjoy dental school. I will say when I went to dental school in the fall of 71, they were not welcoming me. They were very reluctant to have us women in the class. They didn't like it, but there were some black people in the class, myself, five other women, and there were several Jewish men. And those students became my cohorts. We hung together. And we're still friends to this day. Uh, I see them um, several times a year and they come to visit me. I go to visit them. So having those cohort, cohorts certainly helped. It makes a big difference. And when I had private practice, I think that's an ideal career for everybody, but especially for women. Because um, having the three children, I was able to adjust my schedule fairly easily. I mean, you do have to be in the office and you can't just run off whenever you want. But if something big was coming up with the children, I could schedule around it to a certain extent. And so as a um, working mother, I thought dentistry was almost perfect as a career. And now that I'm retired and I've taken on this new role, trying to work with Delta Dental and Henry Schein and other, um, other in the um, dental industry, to recruit specifically American Indians and Alaska Natives into dentistry, 
uh, I find it very rewarding. So I have to say all along the way, I rejoice because I'm very blessed. So, you know, a lot of, um, you know, I, I, I can't be an expert on um, being a woman dentist. Uh, I can't, um, but that's a whole nother issue. I do know from just reading on the message boards of Dental Town, a lot of women, um, they struggle because the bottom line is, um, you know, we live in a society and a lot of women do more raising of the children. And a lot of them, you know, they, they want to be an amazing mother and, but they also went to dental school and they want to be a dentist. Do you think um, it's uh, more challenging to be an amazing mother and an amazing dentist if you own your own practice or if you say, you know, I don't want to wear all those hats. Um, I'd rather go work uh, for uh, someone else, a DSO, public health, whatever. Do you, um, how, how should she, any advice on how to wrap her mind around that decision? Well, in um, 1975, when I graduated, there actually were not a lot of public health opportunities. So that time, I would say private practice was considered the normal route that dentists would take. There are a lot more public health opportunities in the last five to 10 years. And I certainly can appreciate the fact that if you just go in at your appointed time and leave at your appointed time, and yeah, you might be on call, but maybe one week in a month or something like that, that it does lead, it does free up your home time. But because private practice was considered normal in 1975, I just went ahead and did it. And I do have an amazing husband who helped with the parenting duties and supported me in my career. And um, I did have a full-time nanny. I had a full-time nanny and we had help as far as house cleaning and things like that. So I can't say that I was superwoman and I did it all. And I don't know if there's any superwoman out there who could do it all. So to give up something in the home, um, it can be hard for some women, but you, you, you are not able to do it all because both jobs, like you, just like you said, whether you're an exceptional woman or an exceptional dentist, both jobs are very demanding. Um, how, um, you, I call this dentistry uncensored. So, um, I, I don't like talk about anything that everybody agrees on. What would, or is there anything uncensored that you would like to discuss on this platform when you're, you're talking to a lot of dentists, um, um, that they, they things that you wish they knew more about um, Native, Ameri uh, Native Americans? Or, 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 uh, or, 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 or is, do you have any pet peeves on how you find um, um, people don't understand certain things? What, what, what could you share with, you know, what, it, we both share something extremely in common. My, you, you said that one of the first things you talk about on your, um, when you went into the Hall of Fame that you love dentistry because you love your colleagues. And then um, let me try to get uh, some of the words where, you know, you, you're you working around people that are, you say dentists are smart, talented, decent, honest, always interesting. And we get to share our professional lives with these smart, um, capable staff and, and all that stuff. And my four boys, their biggest takeaway from growing up with dad is that Man, dentists are cool. Like, look at you right now. Classic picture. You're sitting in front of a thousand books. And my boys, I, you know, my boys will tell you that whenever they went to daddy's friend's house that were dentists, they saw what's behind you. All these books. And dentists are just really highly educated people. And um, my gosh, they said, then you go to another house and they're debating something about, say, um, history. And they're confusing World War II with World War I. They don't even know what they're talking about. But dentists are just cool because when all your friends have eight years of college, it just wisens up the conversation. So you're talking with a lot of highly educated, cool, smart boys and girls. What, what, do, what do you think they, they don't understand the most about uh, life um, as an American Indian? Well, I just want to go back to one thing. And that's when you talked about being a exceptional dentist and an exceptional mother. Um, I did have the support of the resort district dental society. At that time, they were all men. I was the only woman in the society. 
they did support me. And when I would call with questions or I would ask for um, them to cover for a weekend or, you know, something, um, they always would run to help me. They were glad to help me. That was a lot different than in dental school where I really didn't feel like the professors wanted to help me. I think they wanted it. We felt like they didn't want us there, but when they became my colleagues, then they really did help me. Well, I do have a pet peeve and um, there's a lot of editors of dental journals and dental magazines and the American Dental Association Journal, Michigan Dental Association Journal. They kind of don't like me right now because every month when I get the journal, I do a very basic, non-scientific thing. I go through and I count the white faces and then I count the brown and black faces. And I just did it. <laughs> and there were 225 Caucasian faces and 44 darker faces. Now- For, for I, which magazine, just in Michigan? No, well, uh, yeah, this was a, actually, this was the University of Michigan Alumnus Magazine. The, um, and you fall. called it 20, 225 Caucasian oh. faces and 44 brown and what did you say? Brown and black. Brown and black faces. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I actually own uh, a couple of magazines. I had um, Dental Town and Ortho Town yeah. and I'll never, ever forget it in my life Be because you just, you're, you're thinking of a root canal, a filling, a crown. You're just not being able to comprehend all right. this at the same time. And I was, I think I was lecturing in, uh, to a dental school in um, uh, New Jersey. And this little bitty girl walks up to me and, and um, I says, and, and she has my magazine in her hand and she opens it up. She showed me the editorial board. She goes, they're all white male. Oh. And then she flips the magazine right in my face and turns around and walk back. And I just thought, wow. So <clears throat> the first thing I did is I picked it up and looked at it and I'd never even that's something I never even looked for. It's like, I, I haven't looked under my bed for a mouse. You know, I mean, I just haven't, I haven't looked. I immediately walked out there and got on the phone and um, it's been very challenging. I told my staff, I said, look, we, we're not doing this again. Dentistry is not all white male faces. I said, we got to mix this up. And, and it's tough because of what I just said. A lot of the super successful women champions at dentistry when they go home, they also got to put on their mom hat. And then I, and then they'll tell me, they'll say, <clears throat> even though I'm a dentist and have this million dollar practice and all that, my husband's a lawyer and he's an orthopedic surgeon. He's just as busy. And it's just so, uh, it, it, it's very challenging, but um, um, it's something, but anyway, but go on. Um, so anyway, I, um, there's a couple of dental companies and one of them sent out this really nice merchandising thing. And I'm not going to name the country or the merchandise because then you'll know who it is. And it was a graphic. Not a cartoon, but a graphic. So there weren't people in it. All the graphics were of Caucasian. So I actually called the president of the company and I said, why, if you're having a graphic, I'll send you a brown crayon. You can color, <laughs> <laughs> you can color in a third of them. And um, he said, oh, it wasn't available to us. We're very limited on the images that are available for um, the dental industry to use in advertising. I mean, there's, what can I say to him? You're, you're a fool? I mean, that is not true. They can, the, they can get any image they want. They can well, take I did notice, me. I did notice this, this year, the first time, you know, you send someone on, on iPhone, you send them a thumbs up. Well, they just had one right. thumb and, it, and I, being an Irish man, I didn't even think it was white. It, to me, it looks yellow. And I got my first one, and it was a black thumbs up. And uh -huh. then I, and then, um, and so, uh, so slow has changed. Can, can I ask you some more controversial, um, just, just ones in the headline news? Uh, my, my favorite waste of time is the NFL. And I know the Washington Redskins, um, that name's been in the news all the time. What, what's, what's your, uh, um, take, I, I, I'm, I'm out here with the Arizona Cardinals, but what, right. what, what is your thoughts on the whole Washington Redskins name? We don't like it. We don't like it. My face, my hair, my skin, that's not your costume. Oh. There's, no other, there's no other way to put it. My hair, my face, and my skin are not your costume. We don't like it. And um, there have been Native Americans that have protested, spoken out against that. 
I, I was trying to think. It could be the University of Illinois, but I'm not positive. But I think they have a chief riding in on a horse. So we were letting them know that we don't like that because the chief that's riding in on the horse was whiter than you are, was more Caucasian than you are. It was a, a college kid, obviously. But um, so their answer to that was to try to get a Native American to ride in on the horse. I, it was a college, but I can't remember which one it is. So we don't like it. And even even when you go to Europe, they don't even like it because, I mean, how do, how do people say Europe or white people? I mean, the difference between a Swede and a Portuguese, Spaniard, right. <laughs> Italian, even in Italy, northern Italy, you'll find blondes with blue eyes. Uh -huh. But the southern half, you know, the right. Sicily it, right now is a little island, but Sicily used to be the whole lower half. I mean, right. they're, they're extremely significantly uh i mean they're, they're very dark people so are greeks so um so when, when they said american uh, indians are red I, I never saw red um giant chinese were, remember when we were little it was there were white black yellow and red uh -huh. <clears throat> it's like the only one they got white right was black because yeah <laughs> there's not white yellow and red i've still not seen white yellow and red um so um um so any other uh issues that you see in the news that um um, what were they, what Peter Griffith, he used to have that con on that cartoon, uh, uh, what really grinds my gears, what else grinds your gears? <laughs> well, I, um, there are so many misconceptions from the general population for, uh, Native Americans and they will ask questions like, um, do you pay taxes? Well, I, I own my own home. I owned my own building when I had a private practice. Of course we pay taxes. I mean, they ask questions that are just uh, nonsensical. So um, if they would get to know uh, Native Americans on their own, then, then they would find out that we live lives just like them. We have bills to pay. We have tragedies. We have triumphs, you know, just like everybody else. So not to prejudge, have prejudice, it is still existing, it is still out there in a lot of issues. Um, but did I want to tell you something about the new white wine. You want to hear about it? Yeah. We want casinos too. Say it, do that again. Oh, the wine, the wine, <laughs> a pun on. We want casinos too. <laughs> so now, they think we're all rich from casinos. So, you know, when I was younger, they thought we were all quote unquote dirt poor. But now they think we're all rich. We're not all rich. I appreciate what the casinos have done, but most of the tribes, believe me that it's helped, but most of the tribes have used the casino monies to benefit the tribe. They have elder programs where they provide heating assistance for the elders. They have um, college scholarships. For my nephews, um, they were able to give them, at that time, they were desktop computers. Now they give them laptop computers if they're accepted into a college. So those are just two small examples that they're doing to benefit the entire tribe. And then when things are done, if they have revenue afterwards, they do, they do give it to their, their members. And it, I'm grateful for it, but we're not rich. <laughs> yet <laughs> um not rich yet um but but say better than when you were in dental school oh yeah a lot better <clears throat> yeah a lot better mm -hmm. and and how how was that um um do you think affecting the tribes do, do you think they're well, do you think they're well, happier more upbeat do, you know with humans usually if you see light at the end of the tunnel you can live through anything if mm -hmm. you think you're living you know you you can walk through misery if you think you're going to get somewhere and come out ahead um so so in fact in economics it blows my mind because when i got my mba at asu uh, my professor just said look we we don't know what we're talking about because still the leading economic indicator is um is um consumer sediment i mean if if the um if all the consumers are scared um they're, they're not gonna buy so just mm -hmm. the, the the psychology of all the people uh, matters more than anything. Oh, that is so true. I know when I was an undergraduate and in dental school, I actually 
at that time lived probably below the poverty level, but I did not feel poor. I did not feel downtrodden. Um, I felt like you said, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I'm going to get my degree. I'm going to um, be a successful pro professional. And actually the rewards of dentistry probably are way more than I had anticipated just because I didn't know professionals when I was growing up. You said your sons go over to other professionals' houses and they see, you know, books or they go on trips. None of that was afforded to me because of my family, most of them worked in factories. So they were hardworking, good, honest people, but I didn't have that uh, exposure. I have ha had so many more rewards, traveling, uh, just everything when it comes to lifestyle from, being, from the profession of a dentist that I could not have anticipated. Nevertheless, when I was an undergraduate and in dental school, eating popcorn for dinner, um, I knew at the end it was going to be the light at the end of the tunnel. So that is, that is definitely true. That's a huge motivator, keep you on track. Uh, and, you know, every time you get done with the first year of dental school, you're, what, you're closer, then you're closer, then you're closer. So we all need hope. I, I want to... Um... On your website, um, you have quotes of, um, um, or, or in, in, in articles I've read about you, you have quotes. You you, um, you quote Sitting Bull, and I was wondering, was that your childhood top favorite American Indian role model? Because um, you, uh, you uh, when you accept, when you were entered into the um, Hall of Fame, it says uh, in your article, let, um, let us put our minds and hearts together and see what kind of life we can Build for our children. Uh, written by Sitting Bull, lived 1831 to 1890, a hunk papa, Lakota leader who led his people during years of resistance to the U.S. government. He also was said, uh, was known for saying, "Let us um, behold, my friends, the spring has come. The earth has gladly received and um, embraces the sun, and we shall soon see the results of their love." Um, it was was he your superhero? You know, kids have superheroes. Was was Sitting Bull your your main superhero as a child? Well, we did talk about him, and we had stories about him, and we also had stories about um, Chief White Pigeon. That is his Algonquin name is Ogama Wabamimi, and he is a very revered Michigan Indian. And you're yeah. related to him. You're you're his great great granddaughter. Yeah, fifth fifth great granddaughter. Fifth, fifth, fifth great granddaughter. <laughs> yeah. So um, he was an Ojibwa, and um, the Ojibwa did not leave Michigan. They have they have reservations here, and so their tribes did not leave. So he's very revered. There's another um, chief, Chief Pontiac. He's on the eastern side of Michigan. Those two names were um, talked about a lot. And occasionally we talked about Chief Tecumseh and he's from Ohio. So being from Michigan, we had a, a, a lot of local heroes. Wow, so um, uh, incorporated as a village in 1837, White Pigeon is the oldest incorporated village in the state and was an outpost of civilization when much of the rest of the area was underdeveloped wilderness. Um, so, um, so that, um, and um, any others? Um, no, that was probably about it. Although we did have uh, different names would come up at, um, when you go to a powwow or something like that. Uh, is it Jim Thorpe? I was trying to remember who was the one who was in the Olympics. Um, we would talk about him at powwows, and he would have, sometimes there would be a book about him, and they would um he had some quotes and i don't have them in front of me but he was very uh popular he was more um more germane to our time i mean he was before me but because he was in the olympics in i believe he was in the olympics in germany in berlin i could be wrong on that but um it was it was closer to when our time frame was so how, how, look, I want to uh, switch gears completely. Go, but let's go back to public health. Um, yes. like I say, it, it's, it's the overlooked, um, sovereign, um, 
specialty recognized by the ADA. I mean, I mean, my God, how much attention is given to endodontists and orthodontists? Orthodontists are in the news every day. Um, how what's the status of public health? And how have you seen public health? Where where was it when you got out of school? Where is it now? Um, what what are the challenges uh, for public health? Well, like I said, when we got out of school and they were talking about paying off dental school debt, they mostly talked to us about the military. They did mention public health somewhat, but there weren't a lot of opportunities in public health. And as time went on and they started to establish FQHCs, then there became more opportunities for dentists to maybe go to a rural area or someplace that doesn't have dental services and work at FQHC and work off dental debt. And that has been really, really helpful, especially in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. That's brought dental care there. And it's also very helpful to the dental students, obviously, because then they can work off their dental school debt. And those are called FQHC. FQHC. And that stands for Federally Qualified Health Care. And, and when, when did that come along? Um, how long has that been a thing? Oh, not real long. And I probably don't really know, but I, I would think 15 years. So do they do, does FQHC, is it usually um, this clinic's medical and a separate one for dentists or? No, it's combined. It's combined? Yeah. The FQHC that I worked at after I sold my private practice, they had a pharmacy, they had medical doctor, nurse practitioner, and, but a medical doctor there too. And then they had quite a few social workers and dentistry and an eye clinic. So it was all in one building and the patients um, are those populations that it's difficult for them to get care. Not just the ones that um, you always think about the people that are below the poverty line, but it's not just them. There were handicapped people in wheelchairs that maybe are not treatable in a private dental office, just positionally. So there are also Alzheimer's patients. Some Alzheimer's patients are somewhat combative and they might not work in a private dental office. Also some Alzheimer's paper patients and autistic children, even if they're just sitting there, they'll groan or make funny noises or make loud noises. I mean, it has nothing to do with what's happening. And sometimes that's hard to deal with in a private office especially the private offices that have uh, open operatories. So at the FQHC that I worked at, they had all closed operatories, separate rooms, and they were soundproof. I mean, I think only one room was soundproof. I don't know how it worked. But anyway, we did take all those patients and to the best of our ability, be able to take care of them. Occasionally, we still had to refer out to a pedodontist or something like that, but... um, so it's not just the patients below the poverty line. It's also the ones that are handicapped. Also elderly patients, the nursing homes would bring a van full of patients and some had walkers just in different conditions, the elderly. Some are very spry, like the two elderly people talking now. <laughs> and we would treat them. So it has brought dental care to underserved population. But I mean, um, you know, I think um, whenever you critique something, people think that you're, you know, you're not a team player, you know, you you just have to go along with it, not say anything. And, and it's like, um, my gosh, you would not progress in sports or business or anything. If you weren't trying to always prove, I I think self-improvement and listening to coaches and, and being able to have someone, uh, tear up your idea or tear up your culture, tear everything up. And the thing that's so challenging um, for America is here's Dwight D. Eisenhower. You know, he was come back from World War II. He was the most celebrated five-star general, became the president. He said, every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. And and he's saying that, and he said that, you know, half a century ago, 
And America has been at war 93% of the time. That's 222 out of 239 years since 1776. The U.S. has only been at peace for less than 20 years total since its birth. And then people sit there and say, well, we, we don't have any money for a federally qualified health center. Well, of course you don't. You've been at war 222 years out of 239 years, and you're not making friends over there. I've lectured 50 times in other countries, 50 countries, and I've always taken one, two, three, or four of my kids there. And I mean, what? why, um, I, I don't think Americans even realize they've always been at war. They're, they're a country that's always been at war. They, they have 18 um, aircraft carriers at a billion dollars a piece and the rest of the, the entire world has one. I, I mean, it, it's, um, so there's money for public health, but if your top priority is what, you know, the Roman empire, they had to figure this out the hard way, always expanding the empire, expanding, expanding with borrowed money and debt. Back then they couldn't print new coins. So they had coins. They'd shave the edges off to melt the edges to make more coins. So you look at the Roman history and you can just tell by the size of the coin shrinking when it finally disappeared. Um, it, it's very challenging to get Americans to spend money on healthcare instead of military. Do you agree or disagree with that? Well, it is hard for them to spend money on healthcare. I do agree with that. So um, in Michigan, and I, I don't really know how it's entirely funded, but the state of Michigan had to come up with matching funds. So if a state isn't willing, and states don't go to war, if a state's not willing to come up with matching funds, then that state is not going to have a FQHC. So I'm not sure if the local, I think the county even provides the building. I don't know how all the funding goes. All I know is we were in a county building. <laughs> but anyway, so it takes a lot of cooperation at many levels and commitment at many levels to have a FQHC operating. So is that in the um, forefront of the American population's mind? I, I don't know if it, I don't know that it is. Uh, and um, do you, um, do you ever uh, talk to the, uh, like the CEO of the uh, FHQC? Um, uh, their CEO is, um, oh, what is her name? Um, Beth Robel, or, or any anyway, um, do, do, yeah, do, do, it, it is back to Robel. Yeah, I have talked to her. Yes, and it, it is. Um, what are what are her challenges? <clears throat> uh, well, she is quote unquote running the business, um, securing the funds and getting workers. It's very hard for them to get doctors, dentists, and pharmacists to work at the FQHC. Um, there's a shortage. There's always openings. Any dentist could go to a FQHC and get a job tomorrow. So I think that is a big challenge of hers. And um, so so um, you're, you're talking to a quarter of our listeners are in dental school. So you're talking to a lot of young babies still in dental kindergarten. Give them your pitch to, um, uh, to go to uh, a federally qualified health center. What, what, what um, do you think they should be aware of? Yeah, I think they really should consider it. And part of it is the dental school debt, getting that reduced. I don't know how that schedule works exactly, but um, there were several young dentists there. And then like myself, when I had sold my private practice, there were older dentists there. And it just became a situation where the younger dentists could tell us about some new developments at the dental school or new technologies. And then the older dentist who had taken out thousands of teeth could uh, mentor them on the uh, common sense part of dentistry. And um, the FQHC that I worked at, they had all the modern dental equipment, dent digital x-rays and um, rotary, Endo. you know, all kinds of, um, uh, all, I mean, it wasn't, you're not out in these sticks all alone doing primitive dentistry, they have the latest technology and they do, we do, we were able to refer out and we worked with the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and the University of Detroit School of Dentistry. So um, we could, 
we still at that time had to use the U.S. mail. We weren't able to send things electronically. I don't know how that's progressed. But anyway, we were able to send things to them and get their ideas of what this might be or what that might be. And some patients we did actually refer down to University of Michigan, not very often, but sometimes we did. So this gives a young dentist um, really a wealth of knowledge and experience to draw on. And if they work there for two or three years to work off their dental school debt, they're a lot more experienced if and when they go and open their own practice or buy into a practice. So it's not exactly a quote unquote fellowship or internship, but it serves the same purpose. Um, I think it's, um, I, I think what's interesting about the, the D, um, DSOs are controversial. When I got to school, it was capitation insurance. There's always, you know, there's always the controversy of the decade or whatever. And, um, um, it's amazing that, um, you know, like you said, the, the main opportunities for employment back when I got out of school in 87 was army, Navy, air force Marines. And right. now, um, these DSOs have come out and there's, um, there's FHQs or uh, I just looked up, it's only 20 years old. Um, so it's, it's almost 2020 right now. So that's only been around since the, the year 2000. Um, there's just so many more different employment opportunities. And when these older dentists, um, complain about, um, these DSOs and these chains and all that. I said, well, imagine you just got out of school. You're a quarter million dollars in debt and your million dollar dental office is closed Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You could open that thing and just put that dentist in there with one employee. And uh, you don't do that, but you complain uh, that they went and got a job at, you know, the government or DSOs or, you know, anybody but you. So it, it's easy to be a critic because you don't have to do anything. Um, you know, any, you know, it's easy to blow up a bridge. Anybody can blow up a bridge. Any nut job could blow up a bridge, but building a bridge is very difficult. And you sitting on the, uh, the, the, um, the, the hillside critiquing my bridge. I, I, I want to see your bridge. So it's really changing times. Um, I, I think that times are, uh, amazing. Like I say, when I walk at dental school, if you would have told me about my iPhone, I would have thought you were uh, a witch doctor from Salem yeah, really. and, and um, smoking the funny uh, reefer or something. I, I mean, it's just amazing how it's come. I can't believe our hour went by that fast. That was the fastest hour I've talked to anything. Was there anything um, that you were hoping I would talk about or uh, didn't bring up or any other uh, topics that you're passionate about that you wish we would have discussed? Um, well, I know the Society of American Indian Dentists would love to mentor junior high kids. So if there's any junior high kids out there that are American Indian, well, anybody, it doesn't matter. But if they would just talk to their dentist, they'd probably get a mentor. And there's also something I'd like you, everybody to know, and that's cultural competency for the um, people who are going to work with Alaska Natives, American Indians. And this was developed by the Tribal Health Board at the university and also with the University of Oklahoma. I will send the website to you. This what's, is what's it called again? Cultural competency. Okay. And that's a, a company or a website or? No, no. It's the Tribal Health Board. That's a consortium of tribes throughout the country. Tribal Health Board. Uh-huh. And they worked with the University of Oklahoma because, as you said, most of the tribes are, are out west. And they developed this um, program. It takes about two hours it's you step through four modules and at the end you take tests and they'll give you a certificate at the end. And this helps you to understand the history of the American Indian Alaska Native, their culture, how you can work better in their culture, how you can communicate with them. They talk about historical trauma, the fact that American Indians still suffer from historical trauma and, uh, how that can be rectified in your own clinic. It, this is from a uh, professions, professional point of view. So if you're a social worker, nurse, psychologist, teacher, you have a profession and you're working with American Indian and Alaska Natives, it helps you to work with them. So if somebody could take this training it could help them if they're working with American Indians. Actually, it helps you work with all other cultures, not just American Indians. If we're looking at other cultures, 
whether it's um, immigrants from uh, Vietnamese community, uh, African countries that have communities around here, that um, Jewish communities. It helps you work with all cultures, but it is specific to American Indians. So I'm going to send you all these um, websites, and people can utilize these. It's free. It's free. You could just. So do you just, know? Um, I, I just found it. Um, I googled. It's um. It's how to develop a cultural awareness orientation for your tribe health care program and AI slash AN. So that's American Indian Alaska Native Cultural Wellness Orientation Program. And it looks like it was put together by a Kohler Snyder MPH. And um, the website is, right. um, just like she said, Oklahoma, um, dot O-U-H-S-C dot E-D-U. Um, and very nice. Uh, any, any other, any last words? Um, no, I just, I just want to thank you and I want to thank Dental Town because you're the only national organization that is putting any effort into recognizing the National Native American Heritage Month. It is every November and I do go around speaking in November to various groups and they don't know that month exists. So the fact that you took your time out so that the American Indians and Alaska Natives especially the dental professionals can let you know what's going on in Indian country. I certainly appreciate it. Ah, well, I certainly appreciate you. It's always amazing to meet a pioneer, a first mover, you know, someone that did it first and that's you. Um, it was an honor to podcast every day. If someone wants you to come speak at their dental society, how do, how do they contact you? Um, just at my, at my email, J a Rickert at charter.net. J A Rickert at charter.net. That's J A Rickert is R I C K like Rick, then Ert E R T at charter.net. And, um, and you can also find all of her information at the Michigan Woman's Hall of Fame. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and what a pioneer. Uh, Jessica, it was just an honor to podcast you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. You have a wonderful afternoon. You too. Have a great day.